almost everything we know about this family is contentious. So much so that many devoted dinosaur content creators won't touch this group with a 10-foot pole. And some of them warned me directly just, just to stay away. Yep, that was me. I told him. And yet here we are. How's it going, everybody? So I know that it's been a minute since my last upload, but I figured that I would come back with a video talking about a new discovery that was just made. And of course, this new discovery is having to do with a Spinosaurid, a topic that I, along with Lindsay Nicole, have, we, we've basically kind of agreed that, like, we don't want to talk about that. Yeah, Lindsay actually made a little short a while back that pretty much explains both mine as well as her feelings on the topic of covering Spinosaurus in any capacity ever. I have no interest in talking to you about Spinosaurus. Go talk to somebody else about it, not me. Yeah, that short is actually like my go-to reference. Anytime that anybody's like, why don't you want to talk about Spinosaurus? I'm like, here, watch this short. It's from Lindsay Nicole. It has a lot of cursing in it, and it'll basically show you in 60 seconds exactly why I don't want to do this. Because this could be a really contentious topic. And the Spinosaurus community is, like, super passionate about Spinosaurus. So anytime that you're talking about any of them, people like to fight about it. And, whew, this year, this year has been a fun one when it comes to articles having to do with new discoveries in the field of paleontology. Literally, the very first article that came out in 2024 was having to do with added information regarding the debate between Nano Tyrannus versus Juvenile T-Rex, and yeah, all that. Nobody wants to talk about that. Them's fighting words. And then just like a few weeks ago, there was an article that came out talking about whether or not Spinosaurus aegypticus was actually a good swimmer. So that's being rethought of like it does every six months. But then on March 18th, we get a new discovery announcement about a Spinosaurid, and this one's a little bit easier to talk about. This one is about a brand new species and genus of Spinosaurid, called Rio Levenatrix lacustris. And even though I have always said that I don't want to talk about Spinosaurids, it, th this was interesting enough that I feel like it, it warranted a video. And, well, Clint, there you go. I warned you, and now your phylogeny video is out of date. I don't know what else to tell you, man. We did warn him. But on that note, let's talk about this new creature. Despite only being named in the last month or so, the first remains of real Levenatrix was actually discovered in 2005, in La Rioja, Spain. Now, these remains were very fragmentary, with some dorsal vertebrae, bits of hind limbs, and the pelvic girdle to go on. And initially, this was thought to be uh, another specimen of Baryonyx, another European Spinosaurid from around the same time. But based on the age of this site, it didn't exactly match with Baryonyx, or the myriad of other Spinosaurids that lived throughout southern Europe during the early to mid Cretaceous. But the part that really made scientists believe that they had an entirely different species on their hands were certain aspects of the pelvis. The pelvic bone seems to share similarities with both spinosaurids as well as megalosaurids, the terrestrial family of theropods that were dominant in Europe during the Jurassic period. It is also thought that these hunters were the ancestors to the spinosaurids, and from what this specimen tells us, it seems that that might have indeed been the case. Which means that, for once at least, we appear to have gotten something right on these confusing creatures the first time. But, of course, like every Spinosaurid discovery, for every question answered, we get a couple of new questions to be asked. Now, if you couldn't tell from both mine as well as Clint's video, the Spinosaurus family tree is a mess. But if you think about it, it really isn't all that surprising. For one thing, these are probably some of the most unconventional theropods in the entire clade. Maybe outside of oviraptors and therizinosaurs. Like, most of the other ones were doing some variation of about the same thing. They all had different teeth, and they were specialized to hunt whatever prey animals were around. But going all the way back to very early theropods like Coelophysis, you could see a family resemblance. And this would even remain true of this branch of the theropods for a while. But 
by the time we get to the later species like Spinosaurus, we see it going to a level of strange that only the Triassic period is generally known for. And this family is also extremely difficult to study for another reason. Mainly, how patchy and incomplete the fossil record is. But I know that the entire paleontology community gives the Jurassic franchise crap for the way that they've depicted certain dinosaurs, but I will actually defend the decision to make the Spinosaurus in Jurassic Park 3 look like this. Because in 2001, when this movie came out, we didn't really know any better, as far as we knew. It did look like this. We had only had one semi-complete specimen at that time, and it was destroyed in World War II. For a long time, we had way more remains of things like Baryonyx than actual Spinosaurus. I mean, how were we supposed to guess that this thing was basically the platypus of the dinosaur world? But as far as we know, Spinosaurus is actually kind of the end of the Spinosaurid lineage the most extreme endpoint after generations of specialization that led to this. And we'll get into why that happened in a moment. But for now, we have to figure out where this new species, Rio Levenatrix, fits into this messy family tree. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> okay, so, apparently, there is ongoing debate on where exactly Rio Levenatrix fits into the Spinosaurus family tree. Is anyone really surprised? It could be closer related to Spinosaurus itself, and possibly even a forebearer to Spinosaurus. Or it could be part of the subfamily along with Baryonyx and Suchomimus. But even where it would fall within this subfamily is unclear, since we don't know if Baryonyx was its ancestor or its descendant. This makes my head hurt. Yeah, I know. That's, th 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 this is why I don't like talking about this. So, we've talked about how bizarre and different this family is from other theropods. But you know, one of the things that has always kind of confused me about them is why? Why is this such an uncommon type of dinosaur? Okay, hear me out. One of the few things that's widely agreed upon is that the unique traits of Spinosaurus are mostly attributes that were evolving to suit an increasingly ichthyophagous diet, as in specializing in eating fish. In earlier Spinosaurs, like Baryonyx, we see a mix of traits that were well adapted to catching fish as well as eating terrestrial prey, and we actually have fossil evidence to suggest that they were eating a wider variety of prey. But as we go forward in time, we see a trend toward larger body size, as well as more specialized traits for catching fish and living in or near the water. They have powerful front limbs with exceptionally large hand claws, a trait that would be just as valuable to a dinosaur as, say, a bear for this diet. Their body shape also became more streamlined and hydrodynamic, which take your pick of fish-eating animals today, that's pretty much a must for them if they're actually going to be pursuing fish in the water. And they evolved longer, more narrow snouts with pressure-sensing pits all over them to better be able to feel movement in the water where they might not be able to see. And they had more conical-shaped teeth that were perfect for catching more slippery prey in the water. These are literally things right out of the Crocodilomorph playbook. So that's why they look like that, but my question is, why don't we see this more often? Terrestrial animals making a meal out of fish has been a viable strategy ever since the Devonian. So basically as long as there have been terrestrial vertebrates. And we see a multitude of modern animals who have adapted all of these traits independently of each other. So why is this scene as so odd or unique among dinosaurs? Like, I'm not saying that Spinosaurids were the only family of dinosaurs to eat fish, but they are the only ones that we see going this far down the rabbit hole. What exactly pushed them to this point? Well, to understand that, you have to understand what the region of the world was like where they evolved. You see, even though this family would eventually spread into Africa and South America, they got their start in Europe. And starting around 200 million years ago, during the Jurassic period, the continents were starting to drift apart and Pangaea was breaking up. And as a result, Europe, which was largely below sea level, would be inundated. 
As the Atlantic formed, the ocean flooded into the region and covered most of the land. And this is what Europe would look like for most of the Mesozoic era, an island archipelago. And we talked about some of the effects that this had on stranded dinosaurs in our episode about Hatsag Island. But besides insular dwarfism, the other thing that this was probably the perfect recipe for was turning terrestrial predators like megalosaurs into specialized fish hunters. Because this became a pretty readily available resource through the Jurassic and Cretaceous. At first, they probably didn't do a lot of island hopping. But through the Jurassic, they would have to compete with the megalosaurs for terrestrial prey. Prey that was more difficult to hunt with any regularity because of them being isolated on islands. Hell, this could even be the reason why the megalosaurs didn't make it out of the Jurassic. Because by the Cretaceous period, the Spinosaurids had the run of the place. And they would spread to South America and Africa, where they would encounter Cacarodontosaurs and Abelosaurs. Two families of theropods that already had a very dominant hold on the apex land predator role on their continents. But that was okay, because the Spinosaurids were already doing something else. This probably pushed the family even further down the path of Piscivore specialization, until we finally arrive at Spinosaurus. Now, the story of this fascinating family of dinosaurs is, even now, still largely unknown. For instance, we lack the remains of whatever early Spinosaurs shared Europe with the Megalosaurs during the Jurassic period, but we can deduce that they obviously had to be there. And that's kind of where a specimen like Rio Havinatrix is really important, because it's an animal that has qualities shared by Megalosaurs and Spinosaurs. Our study of the family of Spinosaurids has been hit with a lot of dumb luck. I would like to point out that today is the 80-year anniversary of when that famous Spinosaurus specimen was destroyed in Europe. I didn't even plan for this, but Adam the Spiny Giant on Twitter decided to point this out to me, so it just kind of turned out to be a sort of interesting coincidence. But this new discovery may give us a bit of an idea of what the transition between these two groups might have been like. We'll obviously have to find a more complete specimen in order to fully understand it, but that's kind of the story of all of these creatures. Because of our lacking understanding of Spinosaurus itself, it literally seems like it changes completely every year. Most recently, the debate has been on how much actual swimming they did. Basically, whether it was a pursuit predator of fish, like a seal or a penguin, or if it waded in the water more like a heron. And in my opinion... Stop! Stop! Steve, j j just stop what you're doing. What? I was going to give my opinion on... No! Stop! Stop it. Just, just don't. You're about to set our comment section on fire. Remember what Lindsay said. Alright, fine. Have a good one, everybody. I'm glad to be back.